Good morning, Brushy Creek. It's good to see you this morning. Now, Father, we come to you and say and confess and speak the truth that you are marvelous, that you are wonderful. And Lord, we know that you you bore our sins. He bore our sorrows. But just because we know this doesn't mean that we embrace it every moment of our lives. And so in those moments of faltering, Lord, we ask for your strength and we thank you for your guidance, your mercy, your long-suffering with us. We also confess this morning that we, like everyone else in this world, has fallen short. That we, like everyone else in this world, a sinner, either needing to be saved by grace or a sinner that has been saved by grace. And that's where we are. But we're also in your presence this morning. Safely in the presence of the Lord. A Lord who has sheltered his people, has chastised his people, has led his people has loved, died for, redeemed his people. And God, thank you that whosoever would believe on the name of the Lord are your people. And thank you, God, that you have created all of us in your image, in the image of love. Help us, Lord, to love one another. Help us to look to you, to turn to you. Remind us, Lord, that you are there for us, not against us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It is wonderful to be with you this morning. It is wonderful to be reminded that there is a timeless God who loves us all and has brought us together. We hope that the, in the days since we've been together that you have been well. We know that there are others who are close to some of us who are now dealing with things right at their front door. And so we continue to pray for them. We continue to do that that we can to keep ourselves healthy. But let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. We are still called to the task. Still called to the task of going into every part of the world that we can get to, making disciples, teaching them in Jesus' name. The church has not lost its calling in this pandemic. And if anything, in the midst of the times we're in now, our calling is more secured maybe than it has been for years. We have an opportunity to love, an opportunity to lead. So let me encourage you this week, what you struggle with or what you overcome this week, do it in the name of the Lord. If we can help you in any way, please let us know. Your church, call us, reach out. Let us do what we can. I tell people this a lot. We won't know that you need us if you don't tell us that you need us. This last hymn before we hear from the Lord this morning, before we hear from his word, says simply this, turn your eyes upon Jesus. The Bible says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But why wait? Why wait when we can bow our knee and turn our eyes to Jesus now? Why wait? Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday to you. You'll turn to the book of James. We're going to be in James chapter 2. We'll look at verses 14 through 26. James, the second chapter, verses 14 through 26. What we're going to do today is kind of extrapolate out on James' central idea about being doers of the word and not hearers only. Because in, in essence, that, that's the statement James makes in chapter 1. In the beginning of chapter 2, he tries to get us to see that being a doer of the word has to do with compassion, but it also has to do with treating everybody equally and not looking at one group 
as being the poor and elevating them unjustly, nor do we look at those who are wealthy and we tear them down unjustly. We, we treat everyone in the light of the gospel. Now we get to what I would say is really the heart of James' message, because he takes being a doer of the word, not a hearer only, and he equates that with faith and works faith and works. You know, and a lot of people like to portray the Apostle Paul and James as facing each other, having this argument, where Paul is saying faith alone and Christ alone, and then you've got James saying, no, show me your works, and I'll show you my faith. You show me your faith, I'll show you my works. But actually, you don't have Paul and James facing each other, having a debate. You've got Paul and James standing back to back, pushing against different heresies. Paul is pushing back. James is pushing back. They're pushing back against legalism and easy believism. And so they're actually working together. James fits in well with Paul's theological way of looking at the truth. So let's take a look at this passage. Let's stand together as we take a look at James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, just as the result of, faith, of works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which, is that, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Thank you. You can be seated. Maybe you've heard of the Global Wellness Institute. It's a nonprofit that focuses on research in preventative health and fitness. And they released a report a couple of years ago that found an interesting fact about us as Americans. We spend more money on health, wellness, and prevention than any two countries combined in the rest of the world. In fact, the United States spent $264.6 billion that's with a B, on physical activity in the year 2018 alone. Now, if you want to break that down a little bit on physical classes, that is the classes we would take to teach us how to take better care of ourselves, we spent $37 billion. Sports and recreation, $58 billion. Apparel and footwear, shoes, workout clothes, $117 billion. Denise has almost that much in shoes in our closet, I'm, I'm, I, I promise you. She had on a new pair last night, very attractive. All right, equipment and supplies, $37.5 billion. Yoga classes, $10, million, uh, $10 billion just on yoga. And I used, to, I used to think yoga was a bear that lived in Jellystone Park, but it's actually some kind of exercise thing where you sit around cross-legged and chant and make funny sounds and tell people to leave you alone because you're getting mentally tough or something. I don't, I don't know what that does for your body. But in any way, now I just took some pictures. Does anybody do yoga in here? Whew. Okay. Oh, we got one. Well, just, no, no, not really. Yes, I know. I, I know that was bogus. Okay. Technology related to fitness, about $8 billion. Now, that's a lot of money. But according to another journal that tracks actual activity. Now, let's, let's put the money aside for a second. What are we doing with all that money? Well, according to the Lancelot, for all this spending, we rank 143rd in the world for participation in physical activity. More than 40% of Americans 
failed to meet the global standard of 150 minutes per week of moderate physical activity. And moderate physical activity is fast-paced walking, gardening, something like that. 75 minutes per week of intense physical activity, which is running or strength training. Now, I can testify to this because I, I work out at Gold's Gym over in Greer. And this miraculous things ha thing happens every January 2nd. We have a crowded gym. I mean, it's like I can go in, I got my routine, I kind of time it right, and then come January 2nd, everything is thrown out of kilter because all these new people show up. And it takes about, oh, a week to get sore. And then usually the soreness is not enough to drive them away, but, but the new habit, creating a habit of physical fitness and activity takes discipline. And you've got to work through the soreness if you're just starting, and then you've got to create a new habit. So all I do every year is wait two months, because by March, those people that were sweating in January are sweating somewhere else, but they're not at home. They're probably back on the couch. Because they come in, they're excited, they get passionate about it for a little while, but it doesn't, they haven't really experienced a change that causes them to do a different lifestyle. So here's the thing, a gym membership doesn't equal fitness any more than a profession of faith equals true faith. And that's what James is, is saying here. Listen to the question that he asked, it's a fundamental question in verse 14, what kind of faith saves? Now, that's not the way he put it. What he said was, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works, can that faith save him? Now, I, I can hear people pushing back saying, wait a minute, there's only one kind of faith. We only need one kind. Well, actually, there must be more than one kind if James is asking the question, what kind of faith or does a faith without works mean that a person has actually been born again? So there's faith that is intellectual assent. There is faith that believes in something or it, it, it's a prayer that we prayed or we give mental agreement to a set of doctrinal truths, but none of that actually saves you. And there are a lot of people who have raised their hand in a meeting. They prayed a prayer. Maybe they even got some, uh, some miracle spring water through the mail. I mean, if, if you've seen that commercial, it just makes me want to throw my shoe at the television every night because people are actually spending money for miracle spring water and then they drink it or they pour it over their head and they, you know, it, it heals them. Or even, Man, Vicky's getting into it over here. Did you see her? She was going with that, that miracle spring water. So, so but, but, but here's the thing. People believe, there's so many things that they believe that actually don't relate to salvation. Charles Blondin, you might not recognize that name, but he's reputed to be the greatest funambulist who ever lived. He's a tightrope walker. They actually have a word for it, funamb funambulism. He walked over the Canadian Falls, Niagara Falls, get this, 300 times on a three-inch rope with guy wires to keep it steady from blowing. He took this pole and he walked across. He walked across Niagara Falls and everybody loved it, so he walked across backwards. Everybody loved that, so he put a sack over his head and walked across essentially blindfolded. Everybody loved that, so he packed, get this, a stove on his back, walked halfway out, balanced it on the rope, cooked an omelet and lowered it down to somebody that was on the maid of the mist for them to have their breakfast. Then one day he picked up his manager, threw him on his back, and walked all the way across. And when he got all the way across carrying his manager on his back, the people on the Canadian side were just going nuts. They were cheering. They were shouting his name. And he looked at one of the spectators and he said, you believe that I did that? He said, yes, I believe. I saw it with my own eyes. Then he said, I want you to climb on my back. I'm going to take you back to the other side. He said, not on your life. See, it's one thing to give mental assent, even to witness something that you can look at and say, I have seen that this is true. I have seen that it works. But you don't have faith until you climb on. You don't have faith until you're all in, fully engaged. Intellectual assent to a proposition 
is not faith. Believing, even after witnessing his own, with his own eyes, that Blondin could carry a man on his back across Niagara Falls is not faith. Faith is climbing on. True faith produces something. It produces works. And we must never get those two things in reverse order because works cannot produce faith. You can't work your way into heaven. People sometimes when they read this, if they read it fast, they see a relationship between faith and works that is false. You cannot, your works do not determine your faith. Your works reveal your faith. Your works flow out of your faith. Faith comes first just like the engine of a train pulls the caboose. You have faith and followed by out of which flows works. Because as we're changed, we begin to produce something. Faith will not, never can, faith will rather, does, and always results in works that are observable. Jesus said this. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We're back to hearing, saying, and doing. And and you see how James is pulling these concepts together. Saying that doesn't result in doing is empty and it cannot grant you eternal life. Think about Nicodemus. John chapter 3 verse 2 records this. Nicodemus responds to Jesus. He said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do the things that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus believed that Jesus came from God Nicodemus believed Jesus was a prophet, a teacher who spoke the truth. He believed that Jesus performed miracles by divine power, but none of that was was salvific for him. He He wasn't saved by that knowledge. He wasn't saved until he was born again, until he believed, until he surrendered his life in a life changing way that began to produce works. Now we see Nicodemus later in the scripture and we believe that God changed his heart. But it was changed by an act of surrender. Not just ascension to what he saw, but a surrender to its truth. Now, what kind of works are we talking about? If saving faith produces works, what kind? Well, loving God, loving people. In fact, you can put the Ten Commandments, you can put the Law and the Prophets, you can put it all in that box. Because it all begins with loving God. If we truly love God, we're going to obey God, we're going to serve God, we're going to follow God. And the transformation that takes place from our love for God is going to naturally cause us to love our neighbor. to cause us to love the people that are around us. And so those are the works that James is talking about when we love others without loving God our love for others is superficial and it's based on what they can do for us it's a selfish kind of love loving others because of the love we have for God produces agape love it produces the kind of love that I talked about to these two people that were standing in front of me last night that were repeating marriage vows and they had been through counseling with me and Denise and we'd talk to them about agape love phileo uh, and eros and all the different kinds of love that the Bible talks about but the greatest of these that the faith hope and love the kind of love that Paul's talking about in Corinthians is agape love it's a sacrificial kind of love and it only comes from saving faith that causes you to love someone more than you love yourself because every other kind of love is not real it's shallow and it'll change based on circumstances you know what the good news is this on our worst day God's love is steadfast immovable and on and unchanging and on our best day our love should be unconditional It should be unconditional toward others, unconditional toward God. So, faith without works is marked by three things. An empty profession, a false compassion, and a surface-only conviction. And then faith that produces works that's genuine is marked by two things. A willingness to serve and a willingness to sacrifice. Let's talk about the faith without works first as being an empty profession. We see it again in verse 14. Faith is not believing in spite of the evidence. I hear a lot of people say that. They say, well, faith is is believing even when your mind tells you not to believe. Now, let me tell you what faith 
what saving, I believe saving faith, is obeying regardless of the consequences. Yes, it's important to believe when you can't fully understand because we're never going to fully understand the nature of God on this side of eternity. We'll understand every bit of what God has revealed through his word and what he reveals to us through our relationship with him, that we can understand. But God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. He is so beyond our comprehension that there are things that we won't know until we see him face to face. And so, so it, it's not so much our understanding or our willingness to accept things that we don't understand that demonstrates a saving faith but it's our willingness to live by it regardless of the consequences and that's going to become more and more evident I, I i feel like it's my responsibility as a pastor to to prepare you to get you to think about the world that we're living in now and what that world is going to look like going forward because the acceptance of christianity in the public sphere is losing ground and Christians who take a strong stand are going to be a target. We're going to be under pressure. We're going to be told that we're bigots and that we're homophobes and we're this and we're that. We're going to be called names. We're going to be set aside from the culture, pushed to the margins. We need to understand a faith that doesn't produce works will not carry us through the consequences we may have to face because we're serving the God of the universe. And we have to serve him with our whole heart as we prepare for the days that God has called us to live in. You know, when you think about faith, we're saved by faith, by grace. You've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, we walk by faith. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. And then Hebrews eleven six 6 says, it is impossible to please God without faith. That's how important faith is. That's why we can't have an empty faith that doesn't produce works because it's tied to so much about how we relate to God in a right way. Knowing that the faith we profess is the faith we should possess for salvation is important. An empty faith doesn't produce anything. It doesn't change our behavior. It doesn't reorder our priorities. It's characterized by habits we develop rather than convictions that define us. Now let me say that again. An empty faith can be supported by habits that we develop rather than convictions that define us. Convictions that change us. Convictions that flow out of a Holy Spirit that has come to live within us because we have a true saving faith. People can get in the habit of going to church. Being in that habit is not necessarily a sa an evidence of saving faith. It could just be that you got into the habit of showing up. But here's the thing, a conviction about church, then when people start to put obstacles in your path, you're still going to show up because that faith overcomes the oppression or the obstacles. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to get political, but this actually is where politics and our conviction about who we are as Christians began to cross you have the Supreme Court recently telling a church in Nevada that while casinos can be open at 50% capacity, a church can't be open in, in, if they have more than 50 people in attendance. A second standard, a double standard. The church can't meet, but the casino can be open. This is a terrible direction. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about. And they, they did the same thing in California, Governor Newsom, and God bless John MacArthur, who got up and said, I know we're breaking the law, but we have to adhere to God's law. And he basically said, we're going to have church. They opened church, and people came to church, and they took precautions, and they did whatever they needed to do to try to stay safe and to guard their health. But they refused to let the government say to them, this you cannot do as it relates to your faith. True faith will push us past every obstacle that anybody tries to put in our path because our, our surrender, our, our relationship with God becomes the most important thing to us. It's elevated above all things. 
An empty profession of faith is not empty in the sense that it contains nothing. It's empty in that it's filled with deception instead of being filled with dedication to the truth of God's words. You know, people, people have an empty profession or comfortable with sin. Here's the thing. You, let, let, me just, let me just tell you something you probably already know about yourself. You're born again. Hallelujah. Praise God. You come to know Christ and you get frustrated sometimes because you still struggle with sin. You know, we're going to have to deal with this thing called the flesh until the flesh is in the ground and the spirit is in heaven with Jesus. We're going to have to fight the flesh. We're going to have to push back against temptation. We're going to have to resist the devil so he'll flee from us. But I'm telling you, I run into a lot of believers today that it seems to me are comfortable with their level of the acceptance of sin. They're more, they're more concerned about the acceptance of the culture than they are the acceptance of Christ and having him in their life. And so that's a false profession, something that makes us comfortable. You know, God, God's word amounts to the guy wires, not the guidelines that we should follow. Now, let me tell you the difference. Let's go back to Blondin. Blondin's walking across Niagara Falls. Let's imagine for a minute that he didn't have the guy wires to hold the rope steady. Well, he doesn't make one trip across Niagara Falls, let alone 300. Because the first big wind that comes along takes that rope and moves it over here, and then it moves it back over here. But the guy wires hold the path steady. God's word are the, is the guy wires that comes into the life of a believer. That once we get on the path of righteousness, God's word holds us on that path and keeps us strong. It's not guidelines. It's the power of God's word in our life that changes us. A guideline can be followed or not. Can I just be honest with you? There are times when I don't put my mask on when I should. I mean, the guidelines say I'm supposed to wear it. But sometimes somebody has to come along and say, have your mask on. Oh, put the mask on. And I'm not... This is not a commentary about wearing masks. Look, you saw I, I wore a mask this morning. In between the services, I'm wearing a mask. I don't preach in it because that would be weird. But I'm just telling you, guideline, we get guidelines in our life, and sometimes they're kind of hard to follow. But guy wires, they're what hold, the, that's, that's what holds us on path. It's when God's Word takes hold. A guideline doesn't have hold of us to the point that it keeps us moving straight on the path. A, a guideline doesn't do that. The guy wire of God's Word can do that. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, as any, anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You know, Zach, Zacchaeus, when he came to know Jesus, he gave evidence that his life had changed. He, he engaged in a work. In other words, he said, I'm going to restore everything that I've taken fourfold, and I'm going to give half of all my goods and give it to the poor. Boom! Zacchaeus was all about the money. He was a tax collector. He was a guy that was robbing other people. And immediately, when he came to know Jesus, he said, I've got to, this is, this is a change. This is a difference. The faith in him produced his generosity and his understanding of restoring those he had hurt. The second thing, we see a false compassion, verses 15 through 17. Compassion without action is not true compassion. It's callousness masquerading as compassion. I mean, you see someone that's cold and hungry, and you say, be warm, be filled. That's cruel. That's not giving God the opportunity to bless that person through you. You do realize God has raised us up as conduits, people through whom God does his work. I mean, I'm glad. I don't know about you, but I'm glad God has chosen not to just simply intervene. Now, sometimes he'll intervene supernaturally, and we see God do things, and we just shake our head because we can't believe. But most of the time, God gets in us and uses us as his servants to provide the warmth and the food for those who are hurting in this world. And that's, that, that's, that is a, a, a faith that doesn't produce that is not a faith that's producing anything of value. There's a surface-only conviction. In verses 18 through 20, we see it. True inner faith produces outward 
action. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. In the parable of the seed and the sower, Jesus talks about the seed that goes in the shallow soil. It really doesn't get any roots. And so when the, the, the cares, he compares it to the cares of this world come, then that, that root, that gospel, that truth disappears because it was, not, it was shallow and not deep. It didn't go deep down where it has to grab hold. God doesn't get into the life of a person whose shallow confession is not enough to produce the works that come from too, true salvation. Now I'm going to I'm gonna have to hurry here because I'm out of time. Faith demonstrated by works, by a willingness to sacrifice is in verse 21. Notice it says, was not Abraham our father justified by works? You know what's interesting about this? We're not surprised to see Abraham on this list, are we? And we go, man, Abraham, yeah, we got songs about Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had fun. Okay, we'd have to stand up to do the whole thing, so we won't do that. But we, got, we write songs about it. We know about Abraham's faith. We know he's the father of faith, and we know he was justified because he believed God, and God attributed it to him as righteousness. But you know what's interesting? Abraham's faith had to mature, just like our faith. Because Abraham believed God, but he lied about Sarah being his wife because he was afraid of the people in Egypt. Abraham believed God, but he took Sarah's advice and went into Hagar, and that caused all kinds of problems. But then later on, we see Abraham believing God and being willing to sacrifice Isaac on the altar. That's incredible because Isaac was not only Abraham's son, he was the son of the promise. He was the covenant. But Abraham believed God so much that he he raised the knife before he was stopped. Now, the Hebrew word, or the Greek word actually for faith carries, uh, or justified rather, carries a couple of different meanings. One is verification and the other is when you're actually changed on the inside. And then the other part of that word means that evidence is shown of the change. And that's what's at play here. Abraham was justified. Notice, notice the Bible uses the word here. It says, Abraham, our father, justified by works. What does that mean? Does that mean that he was made righteous by the work that he did, by being willing to sacrifice Isaac? No. It means that his righteousness, because of his belief in God, was revealed to the whole world by the fact that he was willing to sacrifice Isaac. It opened up the door. It, Abraham believed, and his belief, you could see it in what happened with Isaac. Rahab. Rahab the harlot? Are you kidding me? She's an example here? Well, she's in the Hebrews Hall of Fame. You know her name is there? She's in the lineage of Jesus Christ, and she was a prostitute in Jericho. It was Abraham's willingness to sacrifice that revealed the truth of his faith. It was Rahab's willingness to serve strangers. She believed God. And she saw the children of Israel coming. She saw God bringing these people. She believed and she was willing to serve people and help them even though she didn't know know them based on the faith that she had in God. It was a work that was manifested by the the faith that was going on in her heart. And so Abraham by sacrifice and Rahab by service rendered to the world the witness and the testimony of their true faith. Let me close with this. You know, we got our we have our grandchildren now. We we have a pool um, in the backyard, and <laughs> don't get me started. But um, it's a lot of fun. It's just a lot of work. But you know, our grandchildren. It's amazing. Same. We're replaying what happened with our children. What happened with our children? They would stand on the edge of the pool, and you're standing there saying, "Jump, get in, I'll catch you," and they're like, "No." I'm your daddy. If I wanted to take you out, I'd have taken you out a long time before now. I wouldn't do it out here in the pool in front of God and everybody. So I'm not going to let anything happen to you. Jump. Believe. I promise, once you get in, I'll have to whip you to get you out. If you'll just get in. But they just, 
and then all of a sudden, they just jump. That's faith. That's true, but it's one thing to believe that I'll catch them. I'm playing this same game with our grandchildren now. It's one thing to believe that I'll catch them, that I can catch them, and that I can protect them. It's another thing altogether to jump. And I'm telling you, there's, there are people in the church today that have spent a lot of time in church, grew up in church, heard the right things, read the right stories, said the right things, went to the right classes, and yet they've never jumped. They're still standing on the edge spiritually of the pool with God saying to them, come on, I've got this, I've got you. They don't understand why their faith is not giving them peace in the midst of adversity. They don't understand why their faith is not carrying them through a very dangerous time in our world. And it's because it isn't a faith that has produced the works that's associated with salvation. And I would simply say, if, if, you, if you're standing there, Believing all the right things, but you've never taken the plunge? Surrender to God today. Surrender to the call that he's placing before you this moment. Let's stand together for our invitation. Father, I pray in these moments as we come to the end of the service that, God, you would speak to our hearts about faith and works. How faith that's real and living and active and given as a gift from you, Father, is a faith that produces something in our lives. It causes us to act different. It reorders our priorities. Like Zacchaeus, we don't look at the world the same anymore. And our behavior changes. God, I pray that if there are those here this morning that maybe, maybe, maybe they've been standing on the edge most of their life, and you've been calling, and they believe, but they've never taken that plunge. I pray today would be the day in Jesus' name.